Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to CC with BB. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, and we are talking about coincidences, synchronicity, and serendipity. And I use the word coincidence to cover both serendipity and synchronicity. Today, uh, we are caught up in political narratives involving alternative facts, parallel realities, as well as lies, proof, scientific verification, give way to emotionally charged beliefs that allow people to think something is true simply because they feel it is true. A sizable minority of people in the United States, for example, are convinced that the 2020 presidential election was fixed despite mounting, mounting judicial evidence verifying the results. Yet there are alternative facts, ladies and gentlemen, alternative to the way human beings currently think about reality. Our guest today is challenging those beliefs, those dearly held beliefs by a majority of the world's population about what they think reality is. Science fiction may not be fiction, but can be a way of thinking about new possibilities. Our guest today is Gordon Curl Smith, author of the challenging science fiction book, Revelation Antarctica. Gordon left school at age 18 to join the Rosicrucians, the ancient mystical order of Rosi Crucis. He became a self-taught copywriter at a major London advertising agency and began writing theater and radio plays and joined a local repertory theater, theater and became an assistant electrician and lighting board programmer and operator at a major London West End theater. At age 26, he went to France and worked in tourism for two years, then became an English teacher in Paris and rose to become a senior teacher, heading a team of more than 20 teachers. Now, what I'm trying to get across to you is this guy's been in a lot of different roles in life. Uh, he, th he thinks of it as like um, different lives. And they are. He then created a new technique for archetypal artwork, but because it was tediously time consuming, he had to paint in words rather than use paint and brushes. And he wrote uh, a book called Xander Nottis about the origins of our legendary prehistory, legendary prehistory. He set up a language and presentation skills company for advertising executives and, a ma and management and soon won the European Public Speaking Championship in 1984 and 1986. His family moved to NIMS where they converted the garage into an opera house. I've seen the opera house, it's pretty amazing. A two garage place with these great seats and big screen. Upon partial recruitment in 2000, partial retirement in 2014, Gordon published himself, Xander Natus, uh, through Amazon Kindle. It's published in three volumes and now a single volume. He wrote an introduction to reincarnation for children and their parents called Another Egg, Another Life. And finally, the book that brought me to Gordon and Gordon to me, Revelation Antarctica, it was published in late 2019, a few months before the pandemic hit. And in the book, the pandemic was described as about to occur and having happened. Gordon, welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. It's a pleasure to see you and talk with you. Dan, it's a great pleasure to be here with you as well. Thank you. And uh, we've had a few email conversations for sure. We have. Up... Had it. <laughs> yes, we one, have. One or two. <laughs> <laughs> one or two. And we are, and that has allowed me to be able to ask some questions in addition to the ones that you've suggested. Mm -hmm. um, in your many lives, which you have led the many places in reality that you have functioned. Uh, synchronicities have played an important role as a guide to you. 
to get you the place to this place that you are in right now with your book and your previous books. Um, tell us how coincidences, at least some idea of how coincidences have influenced your life. Well, um, this is something which has been, which has colored my life actually from probably about the age of 18, when I was aware of seeing, walking down a street and seeing a particular sign and then down another street and seeing something else. And I must say that quite quickly, I had the idea that there was some kind of master plan uh, and that that plan was going to roll out and roll on. And I was so sure of that, that I started to write an autobiography uh, on the basis of uh, an astrology chart reading. And um, I called that book, which never got finished, actually. But I, anyway, the, 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 the title is interesting because I called it Following the Script. Now, there I was about, I was maybe 35. But it was expressing something which has been with me for a long time. So there is my idea that the, that there is an, that there is a script somewhere, and that my objective is to keep as close to it as possible. And you have a sense that uh, astrology and uh, synchronicity uh, are guides to keep you on the script. Let's just say, without deciding if it's if 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 it's uh, astrology or synchronicity i just know that there is a path to go along and that there will always be compensation along along the way i mean you can have a really bad day and it ends well i mean actually that, that that's a very good description of today because it's been a bit, bit hectic but but um i always look at if, if something but if something unfortunate or not so good happens i look like I, I look at that as being a kind of payment in advance so uh, that, that's a, that's an interesting use of the word compensation um because it's it's what we talk about and 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 it happened to you today uh, leading up to um getting this uh this video on zoom going you had all kinds of problems yep and then you had a problem when i started trying to connect with you and then you found an answer because you got you got some heads a headset <laughs> it, and that that helps settle it but it it's it that's what you're talking about problems and then there's going to be a solution and it's such a very good idea for anybody listening to try to be able to think like that sometimes you can't some things are bad but even then trying to be able to turn them positive becomes a real challenge and often helpful. And the nice thing about that is you're more relaxed when you're looking for the positive instead of going like that. So coincidences or synchronicities are a big part of your book, your Revelation Antarctica. Um, and they, 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 they play an important role in how things happen in there. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us about how Revelation Antarctica and synchronicities fit together for you? Well, to start with, when it when it first when it first started, which was two maybe three years ago, uh, it was just a few fragments uh, with no apparent pattern, but they they the ideas sort of came one after another, and they began to take form but then i actually stopped that and and worked on the ping on the penguin books so that took me an hour, a year and a half the penguin uh, books I, being the another another egg another life just exactly. to be clear it's about penguins and of course you pick penguins because they happen to live in antarctica as one reason for doing them um, but any please continue i just want to be clear about that sure 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 and and penguins are so cute they are um, <laughs> and so well dressed and, and yes and and it was the idea because because there are seven uh, seven types of penguin in the book there is one spirit of of the penguin who goes from one species to another and ends up being an emperor ah and the idea is that this should be attractive for children and uh, 
Uh, so some people have not been too keen on the idea. They say, oh, you shouldn't go into that area. You shouldn't be talking about children being reincarnated and all this sort of thing. But uh, there have been other wiser people who didn't have that. that, that, that yeah, well, idea. I think you like to challenge people's thinking, and that's the whole premise of what I began with. Exactly. And, and so there are going to people who are not going to go along with you, and there are people who don't go along with even thinking coincidences are useful. Uh, and synchronicities and serendipities. Sure. But that's, sure. that's what we're doing. We're, there's a time in this world where we're challenging basic assumptions. Yeah. Uh, one of the, um, w what would you say is the main storyline or the multiple storylines in Revelation Antarctica? There is the story of the couple, uh, Rob, uh, and he, we find him throughout the without the, uh, throughout the stories uh, mainly because he is like a normal kind of guy and him and his and his and his girlfriend and the the the, the child that they adopt was her her, her sister's uh, daughter but they go right through from from the beginning uh, they are in the cinema the night the master ships appeared over the cinemas because there's, there's well, let's come back let's go back to rob and the various stories line but i okay. want to i want to ask you about the master ships yeah uh, because there's some relevance there now uh, one of uh, arthur c clark wrote um a book called childhood's end in the, in the early 50s it's some people think it was his best book because even though 2001 was a his book 2001 was made into a movie as 2010 was but it's really a very good book was i think with some parapsychological things in there but when i was reading your book and there there were this master shifts floating over the major cities of the world i say hey this is what happened in childhood's end um more than uh, like 70 years ago and here Gordon is got the same image on top of that the the intention of the extraterrestrials in both books is good for humanity it, yeah. it comes out in a more controlled way in in um, childhood's end in a way that's very interesting because we get a uh, a utopia and people get bored. And I've heard, I've read that other places, uh, utopias can be boring. I don't think that has to happen, but that's what <laughs> happened there. Um, and with your with your book, the ending was uh, more left up to us that, mm -hmm. uh, and you're talking about this horrible thing that human beings have, which is free will. And it's such an important question. How much, it's not whether we have it or not, is how much do we have in certain circumstances? And that becomes a question that, that you raise clearly, but my, the parallels are so fundamental between your book and Childhood's End that I'm asking you, uh, what about that coincidence, Gordon? Well, this, how about this coincidence? Because it so happens that my mother um uh doreen curl went to school with arthur clark <laughs> <laughs> i like that one okay oh well, i mean <laughs> so you were familiar with arthur clark oh when i was uh when i was uh reading his books yeah when i was 20 or uh, around then and i and, and my, my mother saw it one day and she said oh do you know she said i, I went to school with him <laughs> So the connection between the spaceships and masterships in both books is not uh, random. Uh, you yeah. were influenced to some degree by reading Arthur Clarke's books, and especially especially Childhood's End. Is that? I mean, I'm imagining that. Is that? Would you agree with that? Oh, sure. I, I devoured his books when I around that age, and uh, and it was. It, it did have an effect on me it's it's true well it shows in 2019 i mean it's a very similar pattern except you're leaving it more up to us than uh, than the supervisors who were who were running who were running everything back then in in arthur clark's thing okay mm -hmm. that that answer that answers one of my questions i have a simpler question um <coughs> revelation antarctica reads from right to left
<laughs> if you if you read it in sequence, which of course is only one way to read it, which you'll tell us about. That Hebrew is, Hebrew books go from right to left, and I'm familiar with going from right to left in Hebrew prayer books. <clears throat> why were your book? Why did RA go right to left? Um, I, I, for no conscious reason, honestly. Um, no, I, I, I can't say that, that there was any, the, the, way, the, way, the way it came out, shall we say, the, the way the book came out, um, I, 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 I had a certain control over it, but I, 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 I didn't go, I, I don't, I'm not aware of anything particular in that area. Well, I think we'll go ahead and say what you're talking about, because in a way you're saying uh, you were taking dictation. No, I mean, I would not say that because and, and there are people who talk about automatic writing and, and things like this. Well, it absolutely was not. The ideas came, maybe, but I, I every, every page was uh, was was hard work. I mean, probably on average, every every single page would be re was would be revised uh, three or four times and it would have taken probably two uh, an hour and a half to craft it. There is a I could there is a lot of thought in a lot of different directions in this book and one of the one of its characteristics which is so um, I think compelling and I'm going to try to see if anybody can see this the book has a lot of um, Pho photographic like things, drawings, um, newspaper article looking things, um, and, 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 gr and graphs that are that make it uh, visually um, much more much different, much more different from a lot of, of a lot of books. So that's one way this book is different. How else is your book different from other books, Gordon? Yeah, ju just a word on that. I, I think it is amazing that, that we don't use more illustrations in books i agree in, with you in in the world in the world we live in where everything is an is an image is a is a shot somewhere or other and yet we never see anything in well in particularly shall we say in fiction books there's yeah. never any any illustrations why yeah. not why not probably because uh, it costs too much ah okay i guess that that's yeah that's certainly got something to do with it but um well I, I think that i think you did a really beautiful job in putting those various uh, visuals in there it, it makes it a fun thing to read and it what the impact impact is that it makes the book seem more like a journal journal a journalism attempt sure. that you that it's describing things that are happening and, sure. and that makes it more apparently real and that's part of the fun of this book is that Hey Gordon, what's real here and what isn't, and what might be real? Yes, that, that's the whole. And that's, that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. This reality is like that, and I mean, I'm, I'll mention the the moon. Um, the idea of the hollow moon um, is in there, and, and people have written uh, about uh, one book is like Gordon referred me to is who who built the moon? Right. Uh, there, there's a lot of questions that could be answered, ask about, and with data that is worth looking at. So this book makes you have to wonder about what you believe to be true, is it true? So Gordon, how uh, is, yeah, that's what this book is. I'd, I'd read some of that and I wasn't, I didn't even know if the, if you thought the moon was actually uh, turning faster uh, away from, away from the earth, the face it was showing. And I'm so glad that you had to look it up. And I forget what you call a title, something or other, where uh, okay. lots of moons have one face uh, facing the, the central planet. Yes. And, and we didn't know that until you no. looked up that until you looked that up. So, sure. so what's real and what isn't, how was the moon made is still not very clear. Uh, it's a big thing and it's close to Earth. And of course, my favorite one was that you went to it because I—you're the first person I could ask about this. Hey, Gordon, <laughs> is there anything to the coincidence that the sun and the moon look to be about the very same size from where we're standing? That's what—that's what I asked you in one of our emails, and you well, said you said yes. 
I mean, it that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that is the clear evidence that we are living on a crafted uh, system of, of earth, sun, and moon. And that uh, it, it's such a, a walloping great signal that the, that, the, <laughs> that the moon is just happens to be just right, not only to be right in terms of size, but also uh, of exactly the right distance so that the, it will cover the moon. I mean, come on, that is not something that happens by chance. I, that's what I agree with. And in my upcoming book, uh, I, I mentioned this and my, my uh, conclusion for the book was that's, that's a way to tell people to think about coincidences. It's a reminder, but when you think about coincidence, you start wondering why, how did it happen? And how did, how, did, how did it happen that the moon and the sun became the right size at the right distance from each other? Because it was put there by the people who fly the master ships. <laughs> and that's what your readers are gonna have to figure out is, are they real or are they not real? Uh, well, now you see, we, because, because we are now in a quantum world, or we're, we're at least in, in a world where we have a certain understanding that the quantum issue is there, even if we don't understand it. But at, anyway, one of the takeaways of, uh, of, of, of this means that somewhere, somehow, there's something else happening. So we've got all the permutations possible. So uh, tomorrow, maybe the moon will suddenly become green, you know, I mean, or, or, or something rather simpler than that. But, but all possibilities are possible, and they're all existing at the same time in parallel. It just happens upon us to decide which one of those particular worlds, worlds or, or lives or whatever you like, it depends where we go and we do have a the ability to propel ourselves into one of those worlds or change worlds so that the problems that you've been ex you've been having in the day uh, maybe you, you you go onto another track and end up with a great evening and in on another track you you go miserable and and, and trip over in the road and smash your face <laughs> You're referring when in quantum physics to mm -hmm. a term superposition, which mm -hmm. is meant to mean that an electron can be in and multiple positions, multiple, right. many, until it's either observed or measured. And there's a difference between observing and measuring that people get into. It's mm -hmm. measuring in quantum physics. Now, what you're doing is generalizing from the, the common um, uh, electron going through a slit, the double slit experiments, sure. to the macro level of our Newtonian apparent world. And making that leap is what people are trying to do. And then one of uh, our, the people in our coincidence ambassador group, uh, Sky Nelson, is saying very much the same thing as you are, using mm -hmm. uh, analogies something like yours, that it's what you decide makes what happened, makes it what's happened. And, and somehow that's a retroactive causation is a one way to think about it. There's other ways to think about it. So I think you would, you would enjoy hearing uh, how Sky thinks about things. He's okay. bringing what you're talking about in an even more concrete way than you are. Mm -hmm. So, so th this is, we can imagine you know, like John Lennon, John Lennon, Imagine, his, his song Imagine mm -hmm. was trying to tell us that we can imagine and we can help Im by imagining things to happen. Now, that's one of your favorite ideas. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, um, th there is a sort of a subtitle to the book, and that is as real as you need it to be. <laughs> So it means it, but what that means, in, what that implies is, it, is that we are all the gods of our own universe. We are actually in the hot seat. And uh, what happens to us is going to be the fruit of that, that attitude and, and, and what you do with it. 
So, uh, you know, I think everything is possible and as real as you need it to be, maybe you need it to be really, really come on strong or just make you think for a while and think, yeah, well, that's maybe an idea. So everything gears itself to our profile and to our position on the path. Okay, I, th that's, that's an important subject that is being batted around, as I mentioned, not just with Sky, but with other people. So mm -hmm. that's one of the major themes of your book. Uh, yeah. And you like the Einstein's um, quote about imagination. Could you tell us that? Uh, well, that, now this was, this was a, a funny, a very strange moment. Um, uh, at the back of our garden, we've got a, a, an area where there are a couple of goats. And it, I was walking, just minding my own business, going to the supermarket, at the, just at the, end of the, the, at the end of the garden there. And suddenly I, I, got, um, I, got, I got grasped with this thing that I, I had to declaim. And that was, um, wh what is it? I, I can never forget it. But it, yeah, imagination is the most powerful force in the world. Uh, by, from, but when I, when, I, when I sort of declaimed that, I, I sort of thought, yeah, well, I've heard that before, um, or, or is it my idea, presumptuous? Huh? But anyway, I, I, but so when I came back and I looked it up and I saw that it was, that it was Einstein, I thought, oh, well, there we are. And, but it, it describes exactly actually what I'm trying to do. Try, elaborate on that, please, Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I, what I mean is that imagination is something we all have to some degree or other, but we stifle it in many cases. People want to have concrete, concrete facts or, or something more, more easy to, to, to grasp. But in fact, imagination is a powerful tool and it doesn't, it, you don't have to be Michelangelo. It, if, you, if you create a new dish for dinner, you're being creative. And that is the result of imagination. So this should be in your, in, in the way you operate, in the way you function, really through as much of possible, as much as is possible in your, in your daily life. And if you do, the synchronicities will start speeding up and you'll start noticing them. And it goes back to that spark of imagination, which is a manifestation of what some people call the Godhead. So it's really all part of, of, a, of a total creative uh, energy. And, make the, and, and for us to be part of that is to use your imagination and develop uh, your if you, imagination. I think you're familiar with an old song that goes, imagination is funny. It <laughs> makes a rainy day sunny. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's been out there for a while. Uh, what is not out there that I've seen clearly is the relationship between imagination and creativity. Could you elaborate that link, please? Bah, I, would have thought, I would have thought that it's an obvious. It isn't. Because you can imagine things and mm -hmm. not make them into anything real. A lot of people ah. do that. A lot of people do that. Imagine all kinds of things. They worry about bad things happening and that helps make them happen. That's true. But uh, the, the link between what goes on in your mind and what goes on in regular reality is something that coincidences help us wonder about because we see connections between thought, imagination, ideas, and things that happen out there, and emotions and things that happen out there. But it's not always the case. So that link between mind and environment is something that we coincidence researchers are looking into, trying to understand. Sure. But I would say that, that, uh, that the problems that, that, that can exist, okay, you can, you, can have, you can imagine something, but not carry it forward. Well, this is exactly what a book like this is going to is designed to to change, because by opening up their imagination in all in all all different areas, all at the same time, it one can hope that that every now and then there's going to be somebody where the where the change also happens in them. 
So I'm, I mean, I obviously I'm not. Well, we can't think we're going to convert the whole world, but but uh, but well, we, we we can think that. Well, we we well, can we think that, and I do think that, and I think it's possible to think about having uh, a a collective human organism. I think we have one, and that we're each part of it, and part of what we're needing to do is imagine a future for the collective human organism and all the living creatures on earth as well as earth itself. So sure. the imagination is important, but what I have had to learn is that I needed to imagine things that are within the potential of my capacities to, to make happen. Mm -hmm. I can imagine things that I can't make happen. And so I've learned to be able to try to do that. And there's a restricted level that has to do with where I am in this time, this place on earth, I think. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, how far it can go, who knows? I mean... Um, yeah, that's, think, what, that's what you're challenging. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I'm just thinking in, in what is going on now with the, with the pandemic and everything, this is, this is uh, going to choose going to result in all kinds of things and although for all the for all its the, the terrible things that it does etc but there will at the other end there will there could be uh, that kind of a change i i, I do believe in 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 crisis there's opportunity and and coincidences happen more often when things are in tumult there's some things that can happen i agree but it's important for some of us to be thinking about what can happen up the, as we get out to the other side. And one of the, point, one of the points of your book is, is repeatedly the repression of imagination and creativity. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true though it is. I do sort of bring it in from time to time. You do bring that one in. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you bring that one in. It's, it's a hammer that, well, we'll say a hammer, but it's, it's a soft blow that you keep putting onto it because the yeah. idea of the moon changing its rotation speed and limit and and taking off the the brakes on people's imagination is a central another central idea in Revelation yeah. Antarctica. Yeah, maybe we should just tell tell people that that the idea here is that inside the moon, which is artificial, there are uh, there there are some kind of engines or some kind of laser or something which are sending. A certain kind of energy towards the earth which will stop us being too imaginative but because the masterships or the, the those who draw, who fly the masterships they got the moon moving so that it starts moving faster and it does at, mo at the moment so that the backside of the moon faces the earth every month and for three or four days, there is this kind of influence is no longer there. So during those three or four days, people are much, much more creative than they are when the moon swings around again and the rays come back to influence Earth as they have done for so long. <laughs> it's a metaphor. It could be real. We don't know. Uh, we were talking about Rob and the ordinary people, ordinary person with him, and, and they're not so ordinary. There's a creativity in him. The more ordinary people are the, the guy who likes to go to, to soccer or, or what rugby matches or soccer oh, yeah. matches um, and his wife. Um, and those are the yet more. And you like being able to get them out of the rut that they were in through this book. Sure. And they're very imaginative creatures in there. Uh, there, are, there are human beings that are matched or mi mingled with uh, extraterrestrials. And of course, there was the, the, my question about who's the good ETs and who's the not good ETs. ETs. And that's some of what you left up with, um, with um, up to the reader. And I am pretty sure I was reading, yeah, I was reading in, in uh, Childhood's End, there was reference to a three-dimensional chess game. Which is ah. right, which is right there at the end of your book, ah. and, and that and I I just remember so th there may be more. You and Arthur Clarke are linked somehow in this <laughs> and all this. That's what it, that's what it's looking like to me. We have about ten minutes left, Gordon, and there are some things that I know you want to be able to to talk about, and <laughs> one of them is um, what kind of reactions have you had to your book so far? So far, I mean, we have had 
we have done quite a few of these sort of readings. And that means uh, picking out three numbers, uh, be, preferably for people to pick these numbers before they actually get the book. And then we can, uh, so say 345, 62. So then we can go and take those three items from the book and put them together. And nine times out of 10, uh, we get something which is significant to the, to the person. And this has happened, uh, we've done, a, I don't know, we've done about 15 or so up to now. And all of them, except one, which I've heard about, but, uh, uh, but, so, but, uh, but most of them will, uh, are completely gobsmacked because it, it relates to things that they believe about, that they believe, that they think about, that, that concern them. And it's all metaphorical, but uh, it, it does have some rather remarkable uh, points about it. And there are, there are, there's one, at least one family that we know of, that uses the book uh, almost every day to 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 see what the what the uh, what it what it's going to say, what the oracle is going to say to them and tell them. By uh, I mean, okay, there is a contribution from the person as well, and you might say that it's sort of wishful thinking or, or whatever, but it doesn't matter as long as they as long as they think of something different as long as their imagination is 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 worked upon i mean that's that's all good so um that that is one point of the and, of let's, the and book. Let, let's be clear that the numbers the three numbers refer to one of uh, a, a three out of 100 different chapters we can say yeah of the, of the book and so the person who's doing it looks at those particular chapters and tries to make them relevant if possible to what's going on with them now. Sure. And and but the way this start this this was absolutely not on the agenda uh, uh, until relatively recently. Well, it was but it must have been about uh, September. And uh, so the book was the book was finished. In fact, it had already yeah, it had already been published. But uh, one morning, about six o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I sat up straight and I sort of declaimed doing my Shakespearean bit. And, and I said, the book is also an oracle. I mean, my poor wife, she was scared stiff, you know. <laughs> um, and, and I thought, what on earth am I talking about? What does that mean? So it was just little by little that, that I began to see what that meant. And, and when I started doing the, the thing with the three items, um, they, these things started to get to, to fall into place. And so this was the, this declamation is in the same league as the uh, as the, 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 the discussion or no, the, the, the imagination. The, yeah. The imagination thing. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um... Finally, uh, at least maybe finally, I give you some, have you some extra whatever you want to speak about towards the at the last part of this. Um, what is the purpose of adding all that extra material? I, I'm really glad you did because it it, it elucidates illuminates uh, much of what was in a particular chapter. Because each some of the chapters said you, you got to go to the vault to find out more. Uh, about what this is about, and it was much more than uh, what was in the was in the sim simple chapter. So, uh, what is the purpose of adding all that extra material? Well, initially, it was all integrated into the whole book, but we realized that uh, uh, this was not a good idea because if you were you were having a something that was really quite light, and then you hit the the quantum mechanics bit, I mean, too many people would get put off. So uh, it was decided that, that, that it would be much better to take that away and put it into a, a follow-up volume later. But people who do the, who do the, um, the divining bit, uh, they do get the add-on chapters as well, because they, in, that, in that point, in that case, they are important. So uh, it's, it's available on, um, on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. Along with uh, its prequel, I guess, 
what's the name of that one? Something. Uh, Gen Genesis Gen Antarctica. Genesis Antarctica. Because I, I don't have that one and didn't read it. So I didn't read it. But that's kind of a what happened before um, Revelation Antarctica, I'm thinking, is what it was. Yeah, yeah it, it's, also, it's also very linear. Um, it, 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 it's sort of uh, inspired by Tolkien to a certain degree. Um, but there, but there are there are already some diagrams and 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 magazine cuttings and stuff from the from what is well from from adverts and all, all kinds of stuff like that. But not there is not there are not as many as there are in in the latest book. You're warming up. You're warming up for this one. Um, <laughs> What, what else might you like to tell our audience besides how they might get the extra material if they get your book? Well, they will, they will be able to get it. Um, it, will, it will be published together with a load of other things uh, in, a, in another book in about probably towards the summer. Wow. You keep putting it out there, Gordon. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not quite sure. But I. But I mean, already with the stuff that was that is in the vault, that already is more than a hundred pages. Oh, it is. Um, so uh, there's also some some crits from people before we started doing the oracle thing, and there are there are one or well, there are one or two other things, and um, and I'm writing all the time. So it will be it will be a consolidation of what has been done and, and the experience we've had with the first book. OK, so one one final uh, words from you, Gordon, and uh, I'll, I'll say goodbye to our audience. Yeah, well, I I hope people will try it out and see if it makes any difference to the to, to the way they think. Um, it is a different kind of literary experience, and I also believe it should be it should be fun. I don't see why uh, it shouldn't be. Um, but it if it makes people think, then then that is absolutely wonderful, and that will mean that it has fulfilled its mission. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Gordon Curl Smith. Um, it's a, great to be able to talk with you directly because yes, we haven't been able, we we hadn't before and we have now and I think uh, we'll we'll continue this conversation in one form or another. So thank you very much for being on Connecting with Coincidence. I'm your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, and we will see you next time. And a great thank you. This is a mental atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.